Welcome to Deepen with Pastor Joby Martin. The Church of 1122 is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're praying this message helps you deepen your relationship with Him. Now let's dive in. All right, well, we are in the final week of Anything is Possible. It's crazy. This journey is coming to an end. We're going to end with a bang. We're going to end with the Holy Spirit. Because how else would we end a book on miracles about Jesus? And before we dive into the gift of the Holy Spirit and all this means for us believers and really like how we finish this book but continue living out everything we've learned from this book, which I think the Holy Spirit is going to really help us to do that. Uh, We did have a chance when we were in Israel, we did have a chance to sit down, the three of us, and have a conversation on the Southern Steps, which is the place where the Holy Spirit fell. And we just got to share some of our experiences that we were having in Israel. So we're going to take a moment and cut to that conversation. All right. So we are in Israel right now. It's incredible. We are currently sitting on the Southern Steps, which... Pastor Joby, you just preached an incredible message on Acts 2. We worshiped. We had other people from other tour groups joining our worship time. It was awesome. Um, And this has just been an incredible week. We've mentioned so many times, last time we did this podcast, talking about Israel, which is how I actually ended up in Israel because we talked about it so much. So thank you for that. (laughs) Um, Just about how when you're here and you see these places, it just changes scripture for you. It makes it really come alive. So this trip specifically, has there been a moment for you guys? What's been one of the deepening moments of this trip for you? How about you, Joel? There's been a, there's been several. The, they've recently excavated the Pilgrim's Walk, and it leads from the Pool of Siloam kind of up the western side of the Temple Mount. And, kinda, and so being able to get to see the steps where the pilgrims would literally walk up where Jesus heals the blind man down at the pool, and then they find, they find him later on up here. I don't know. That, that's one of them. This is a big one. I love the Southern Steps. Um, getting to watch you teach here. I mean, I, I love that. I just, I mean, you know, Peter did it 2,000 years ago. 3,000 were added. The next service, you just said 5,000 more. Um, I, I don't know. The Lord, the Lord made good on Joel 2:32. Right, like, like right here. Uh-huh. Like, not over there. <laughs> not, right. not down there. <laughs> but literally somewhere in here. Also, it's thought that maybe when Jesus was 12 and he, Mary and Joseph were looking for him and they said, we didn't, couldn't find you. He said, did you not know I must be about my father's business? Some folks think that occurred kind of right in here. So I don't know, the visuals are just crazy. I mean, there's like Mount of Olives right there. Maybe we should just get a hotel room and, and, and like book it for the next year. And then if when he, when, when he returns, the mountain will just part one side and go that way and that way and we'll just watch his return. That's right. Um, one from a bunch of years ago, I bumped into some missionaries from 1122 that were missionaries to the Jordan, but they had just come over. And that was at Caiaphas's house, which is right over there. And as I was praying for them, I was thanking God that they were fulfilling the Great Commission, which was given right over there. <laughs> and I was asking that the Spirit of God fill them and the Spirit of God fell on his church right here. And it was like... Um, Ready Player One. I was like in the Bible as I was asking God to do the things in the place where God had already done some things. I think on this trip, we were on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things as a pastor at our church is I often don't get to spend 10 days with 60 people from our church. I'm typically lights, camera, action on stage teaching to a bunch of people in rows. And I there's some people here hurting. They're just got some stuff in their life. And just like Jesus calms the storm, we said, if, if, if you've got some storms in, in your life and you need Jesus to speak to that thing and say, peace, be still. And we did some prayer and anointing there. And um, yeah. it was just, it was just pretty special. It was special. That was, I, that was probably the moment I would pick too. Especially we sang Oceans by Hillsong and we're on the Sea of Galilee singing if I trust you, Lord, I will walk upon that water. The, and we're on the water that Jesus walked on. Right. It was a mind-blowing moment for me. Um, so we're talking about this whole series that we're doing, Anything is Possible, and it goes in correlation with your newest book. And it's all about the nine miracle, nine of the miracles of Jesus. So as we're in this place in Israel where Jesus walked, 
how do those things do this number? How, how do being in Israel and then as we're doing this series for our church, can you make those two things come together? Yeah, well, the reason that you can believe anything is possible is because the tomb is empty. In a couple of days, we're gonna go to the garden tomb, we'll check once again, and I know that it is still em empty. And one of the things that you see in the scriptures, particularly the book of Acts, is like when Peter and John get arrested, right around the corner, they healed a guy. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks. They get arrested for that. The Sanhedrin are, are trying to get them to quit using the name of Jesus. Everybody loves a good healing, but you gotta quit with the Jesus stuff. And they say, you choose for yourself what you've got to do. But we can't stop talking about what we not have believed, not have read about, not have been taught. We can't stop talking about what we have seen and heard. And what they saw was Jesus get crucified over there and then three days later, walk around here again and appeared over 500 people for 40 days and ascend back to the right hand of God over there. Right. They saw that. They were eyewitnesses. And now we are in the places where they saw and heard those things. That's good. Okay, last question. Charles, how does being in Israel change the way you read God's word? It's like looking at it in, in 4K. I, you can't, I just can't, I can't ever look at it the same. You just talked about Acts 4. Peter and John are arrested, literally kind of right there. And then when they finish, they go into Solomon's part of the portico or whatever. We think that may have been right yeah. there. And like, that's a that's a 60 yard walk from right here. I mean, I, like when I read Acts 2 now, I, I literally do think about these steps mm -hmm. or the pool, or we're gonna be, I think tomorrow at the pool of Bethesda, right there at the Sheep Gate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's like a, it, it's like a, it's like, I know we do this on our iPhones, all of us kind of expand and, and we're constantly doing that, but it's like the spirit of God in you when you're now reading scripture kind of does this on a word and it, and it, and it, it manifests. And like, I mean, that's the Mount of Olives right there. Right. Jesus ascended off of that. He climbed up, stepped into the Lord's chariot, took off like Haley's Comet and there are two angels sitting up there saying, why are you still looking in the, in the sky? He's coming back in the same way left. And that, that, that happened right there. Right. What also gets me though, is in that moment where he ascends to the right hand of God the Father, it says some worshiped and bowed down and others doubted. Mm. Like, can you imagine no. like he, the resurrected Jesus is like Iron Man, you know, or how, I don't know how it went. And then right. one guy's like, I don't, I don't think, think so, so, man. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Which one of the things that tugs on my heart are the people here. Mm. Our tour guide knows more about the Bible but he, all he knows is the facts. He still doesn't see Jesus as his Lord. You go to the Western Wall, read Romans 9 and 10 in front of the Wailing Wall. Mm. And Paul goes, my heart breaks for my kinsmen. Oh, that I would be accursed that they mm -hmm. could be let in. And then he basically ends it with, so you mean to tell me these religious people that are working so very hard, praying to the God of Abraham, if they don't get the gospel, they don't get in, but a wretch like me does. And the answer is that's right, because that's mm. what grace is. Right. That, it gets me every time. Another thing I love about this is, funny enough, in a shawarma shop <laughs> right over around the corner, not first century, but it's good. <laughs> we started talking about writing a book together. Wow. And, um, and so these trips for us have helped us a lot. And when you read Anything Is Possible, it starts, with the first time I was ever in the empty tomb, yeah. we just talk a lot about walking around the places that Jesus walked around Yeah. as we look at the miracles. So good. Well, it's been an amazing trip. I did have some bad shawarma. <laughs> it was a little too jiggly, if I, I say so. Hey. <laughs> but I'm hoping to redeem it here in Jerusalem. Well, we're gonna pray for healing, because if the tomb is empty, anything is that's possible. That's right, that's right. Well, thank you guys so much. Let's enjoy the rest of our trip. Amen. All right, well, Israel was incredible. Um, what a lot of people didn't know is I was so sick in Israel because I was early on in pregnancy. Where and I still, I, know that. I still can't eat hummus. <laughs> and we are like so many months later and like I can't even look at hummus, honestly. Well, it, it doesn't help that over there it's pronounced hummus. <laughs> yeah, also that. It sounds like you're getting sick when you... <laughs> and they eat it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No just doubt. like every meal, it's like, oh, can I tell you a funny hummus, hummus story? 
please. So me and Pastor Ben Williams and Pastor Ryan Britt and some other people are over on our original like voyage trip to learn the thing so that I can teach it when I get back. And we're eating at, um, we're off to see a Galilee eating at like Peter's Fish House or something like that. So, it's, so you know, Peter's, Peter's Fresh Catch or something. <laughs> One of those places. And so everybody's got fish. And, you know, every meal, hummus comes out. It is to Israel what chips and salsa is yes. to the local Mexican restaurant, okay? And I just can't stop eating it. I don't I don't ever eat it here, but, you know. So you pair it, tear off your pita, you get it. Well, Ben Williams eats like a bird, not even a big, like, bird, like a little baby <laughs> bird. He's not, he doesn't eat much at all. And he kind of picks at his food. That's just who he is. He's always been that way, whatever. The guy comes over and it's like, sir, you're not eating it right. Oh, He's no. like, excuse me? And the dude has hands like MMA mitts, bro. I'm telling you. <laughs> this Israeli dude tears off a not a huge piece of pita bread and scoops it through that thing like Bob the Builder. Like it's on his hand. It is. Oh, it's it's and then he just puts it in Ben Williams' no. face and he's like, open your mouth. <laughs> oh my and Ben looks at us for help and we're like, come on, dude, eat it. <laughs> yeah, you're just taking him <laughs> And like a baby bird, he just opens his mouth. The guy's like two knuckles deep into his oh, face. No. So oh, that's terrible. We love Ben Williams. Yeah, I resonate. With so think about that the next complex. time you eat no. hummus. Well, I don't know if there's going to be <laughs> next time. <laughs> um, no, but Israel is an incredible place. And the Southern Steps was truly one of my favorite places that we landed. I think um, just being able to be where the first church service was, and we talked about this in a previous episode, but we worshiped there. You did a teaching We when we started singing other people, we were singing goodness of God and other people joined in. And I don't know, it was just a really, it was a beautiful picture of the church and it is the launch pad. You know, we've been f focusing on Jesus's life and all of these miracles. And I love that we're closing. I love that you chose to close with honest, almost like, okay, so where do we go now? And, and wh how, what is the Holy Spirit's role in the believer's life? to take everything that we've learned, our relationship with the Lord, and live it out. Um, so before we dive in into all the ins and outs of the Holy Spirit in this chapter, you both grew up with very different backgrounds, um, religious backgrounds, well, probably multiple backgrounds, but, and so different viewpoints on the Holy Spirit. So I'd love to hear like what your take on the Holy Spirit was when you were growing up. And I don't know, when you were writing this, was there ever like, differing viewpoints of the Holy Spirit or his role or I don't I just would love to hear that because I know you grew up with two different backgrounds. First, the reason that we end with this chapter is the the Holy Spirit is the now what to a book on miracles. Mm. And if there are any preachers listening, that's how I preach. So you answer three questions I answer three questions when I preach. What happened? So what? Now what? Most preachers stop at the so what and don't get to the now what. And if you don't preach to the now what, then so what? Like, okay, that was true and that may be moving, but what does this have to do with my life? The Holy Spirit currently indwelling the believer is the power by which we can be obedient to what Jesus said when he says, you're going to do even greater things than I've done. Mm. That's why. Yeah, that's good. Now, I didn't grow up in church, but got saved at a Southern Baptist camp. And the 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 Holy Trinity of the, you know, like the independent fundamentalist Southern Baptist kind of folks was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. And we were afraid of the Spirit. Mm. Uh, we were cool with his role in our salvation, but it, it, it pretty much stopped there. I would say the majority of the people that I went to church with were cessationists. But what they were really afraid of was like the sign gifts because they didn't understand them. And that limited, it put a damper on all things. So two episodes ago, we talked about uh, extravagant gratitude and worship. Well, the reason that like you couldn't raise your hands in the church that I would go to is because they were afraid somebody was going to catch the tongues and then misuse <laughs> it. And then we would be, there was a problem. Yeah. And so, you know, I've quoted this. Irish proverb a million times now, but for every mile of road, there's two miles of ditch. So the ditch we were in was that, yeah, yeah, those things may have happened then, 
But when the last apostle died and the word of God was delivered, then the need for the Spirit to do his Mm -hmm. miraculous kind of work is no longer needed. Mm -hmm. The amount of hermeneutical gymnastics you've got to bend around to come to that conclusion is, at this point in my life, is mind-blowing. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. I grew up in a um, in the early seven. I'm I'm 53. I was born in 69. So in the early 70s, we were at a little church here in Jack's Beach called Beach's Chapel. And in this country, in that period of time, and the movie The Jesus Revolution kind of gets a documenting this. There was a renewal or a wave of the the power of the Holy Spirit sweeping through this country. And I, you know, I didn't know it. I'm just going to fo- church with my folks and. Um, that that happened at our, and I got to see it happen. I got to see really neat men, powerful men of God, preach the word in faith. Look at the Book of Acts and say, "This kind of this 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 could be what we could be doing if we believed what this thing says." And so the Holy Spirit, the the the, the terminology or the phraseology we would use, and some of it can be semantics, is that baptized us as people. There was a baptism. And you can get way off in a sidecar talking about it. All, second bet, all extra stuff. I'm not going there. All I'm saying is there was a thing that happened and we saw it and the Spirit of God fell in a really beautiful way. So for several years, I felt like I grew up in a healthy place. Now, granted, there's always abuses in the church because you have sinner broken people and that's just kind of what we do. And so We did see the abuse of it some, but on the whole, we did see people healed. We did see people Mm -hmm. delivered. We did see a lot of people come to Jesus and surrender to his lordship. And we saw the word preached in faith and we saw marriage, all of that. Well, the problem that we encountered, which is also the problem that you see in the book of Acts, and I think we see it in Acts 8 with Simon the sorcerer, give me this power, is that people begin equating that movement and that power with what can I get from it. So pretty soon, we would have a, what I call power junkies or spirit junkies showing up to church saying, hey, don't don't bother me with the truth of the word. I don't want to spend time on that. I just want the power. And so then the word gets sacrificed at the altar of the abuse of the power, and then it just becomes a charismania. Mm. And so we left. And uh, at this time, then the Spirit of God moved into what was the Episcopal Church or Episcopalian Church, later became the Anglican Church. And I got to see in a real beautiful way when Bible-believing, faith-filled, Spirit-filled men preach that word in faith and the liturgy is married to it. And there's a real beautiful, and I fell in love with the liturgy. Mm. And I fell in love with that place and and that people. And but then the same thing happened. And in, in that particular instance, the homosexual movement came in and, you know, next thing we know, we have a, a gay pat priest, whatever. So my takeaway from that is, yes, this is how I came up. And I was very comfortable watching the gifts in practice. And as much as I'm able, I think I was able to discern between what was healthy and had good fruit and then what, what, what became crazy. Mm. Was I able and am I able to see all of it? No, of course not. But I don't just because there the point of the, the point I'm getting at is just because there were abuses doesn't mean that God isn't working that way today in us mm-hmm. and wants to work through us and still very much desires to fill us and baptize us in and with and through his spirit the same way he did with his disciples. So that's what you know you're asking about our process working. I've never felt not one single time. I've never once felt, Joby said, you can't say that. Mm. I've felt the freedom to just work with him and be the writer the Lord has made me to be. And I've never written one single thing that I didn't believe. Mm. So in terms of us and our backgrounds and where we came from, I'm grateful the Lord birthed me where he birthed me. I'm grateful the Lord birthed him where he birthed him. And the, the thing that I've come to love about him is while his experience and background may be very different than mine, he really doesn't believe any different than me. Mm-hmm. He believes the word. Sure. And if things if this thing says it, then he's like, it's true. So while he may not have the memories to back up on and go, I've seen that or whatever, it doesn't matter. He's just like the one with the issue of blood. This thing is more 
true than my circumstances. Mm-hmm. So it's one of the things I've loved working. Another thing that's been awesome for me is the word is sinner. The word is like always in the, like for him, it's just always right there. He never mm-hmm. takes his eyes off the cross. So I've loved, I've loved that in our process. Mm. Um, it's been healing for me in that way. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, man, there's no wrestling with us over... Uh, it, but it, the reason is because the authority is the Word of God. The authority mm-hmm. is not what I think the Holy Spirit ought to do, and the, and the authority is not Charles' experience in the 70s. It's not the, mm-hmm. the authority. The authority is just the Word of God. There's been some stretching for me. I mean, in the first book, If the Tomb is Empty, I mean, there's a prayer of deliverance that Charles wrote from another one of his books, what if it's true, or they turn the world upside down? One of those one two, of them. Yeah. <laughs> and I just straight copied and pasted. It, but that was rooted in Mark nine with a dad going to Jesus, going, "I believe, help me overcome my unbelief." Right. Mm-hmm. So it was rooted in the scriptures. So, but that's the thing, man. You can have. Um, I mean, unity doesn't mean uniformity, although we believe the same things. He he is definitely more spirit, spiritually sensitive than I am. That's his lead foot. My lead foot on like problems and things is it, it really is often like leadership and grit and mm-hmm. you know doctrine, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And his is prayer anointing spiritual warfare is his first thought. Mm-hmm. Mine is more like, oh yeah, that's right. Ephesians does say that, mm-hmm. you know? And yet we're at a church that on the regular does prayer and anointing services for healing. Yeah. But it's not because I'm a faith either. It's because I'm a Bible believer. And James says, anyone among you sick, pray, anoint with oil, confess your sins, and you'll be healed. There's a, let me, just before you jump from that. Yeah. When the disciples, on the day of ascension, Jesus hops in the Father's Mm -hmm. chariot, rides out, like Haley's comment, all of them are looking up at the sky and they're wondering, they turn around, they're about 120 people, husbands, wives, children, everything, and they walk down that mountain. I believe the primary question on the tip of their tongue is what on earth do we do now? Mm-hmm. He's gone. Power just left with him. And a couple of days later, they're eating dinner and the roof starts shaking. Mm-hmm. So that's the answer that they received, which is also the answer. we. And if you look at Acts, 28 chapters in Acts, if you take out the miraculous, you've got to take out every single chapter. There is no Acts without the miraculous. Now, with regards to, and this is a, this is a, I wish I was more like him in this regard. The other night we're standing in line signing books. He's right. I often do think through warfare and those are sort of the questions. Anyway, this girl comes up, this beautiful lady, and she lays her book down. She's real timid and she asks a question. She says, she just starts off with, how do you know it's the right time? And in my mind, what I'm like, I know she's at like, what do you, how do you know it's the right time to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus? I can tell it. That's what her body language says. In my mind, I'm thinking through, hmm, I wonder what the hang up is. <laughs> Joby doesn't have that. He doesn't have that thing, whatever the thing is I was wrestling with. He doesn't have it. He just looked at her and he said, the time is right now. <laughs> do you believe? And he, this, he, then he just like, he's just looking at her and I'm watching this woman this beautiful lady be transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. Actually, it probably happened a few steps back there, which Joby said to her. So he, he, he talked, he asked her, do you believe all of this? I believe, admit, believe, confess the whole thing. I'm watching it right there in front of me. And I thought, what I'm thinking inside is no, two things. This is way cool. And two, <laughs> why didn't I have that thought? <laughs> and to him, it's totally natural. So I, I would love to be more that way, working on it. It was awesome to see this beautiful lady. And there's more to that story, which is not mine to tell, but it, it, it's awesome. And to see his, his pastoring, his shepherding, his care of her in that moment. Mm-hmm. Could I have gotten there? I would like to think so. Yes, maybe. I hope so. But in that moment, that was his, and that's a, it was beautiful to watch. It's crazy cool. The Holy Spirit was absolutely 100% in that moment. Sure. Part of the evidence of the Spirit of God in our really brotherhood is there is 
zero spirit of competition. Mm. We're just, we like the same things. We like to hunt, which is cool. Our wives and kids get along. That's cool. It's easy to just be together. And yet we can like shift into this really spiritually intense. Let's dig in to see what this thing says, Mm. the Bible, so that we can put it in a book that hopefully is useful to people but um it's beautiful yeah it's very much like uh workout <laughs> partners that are just trying to you know the bible says let us spur one another on with mm-hmm. encouragement there's a lot of that i love it we all love it so you say towards the beginning of this chapter that you're not going to feel warm and fuzzy but that this is going to be more of a theological beatdown which i kind of laughed at that because i think that's kind of how you are <laughs> In general. (laughs) But um, why is a chapter on the Holy Spirit more of a theological beatdown than it is like this warm, fuzzy, you got this, let's go do it in the world? Some of the abuses of uh, pneumatology or the study of the Spirit is that. It's like, what does this mean for me? What does he owe me? It's all about me. A part of the reason, uh, I just wanted to, let's just walk through what Jesus specifically in John 14, 15, 16 says about the Holy Spirit and what his role is, period. Mm -hmm. Let's don't add words. It's not even a comprehensive study of the Holy Spirit because you would have to study the entire Bible from the very first verse to the last, Mm -hmm. okay? But let's just see what he says, period, and believe the words said about him, and that's it. And Mm -hmm. so... I mean, especially when you get into things like conviction of sin and conviction of righteousness and judgment and things like that, it just says what it says. So we have such a misunderstanding of the Godhead. We think like God the Father is the main one and Jesus is the nice one and the Spirit's the weird one. That's not it. It's not, man. There's one God in three persons and a perfect love, all-powerful, omnipotent, mutually submitted relationship with one another and we bear his image. Mm. And so, like, you can't... If it is true that you don't know who you are unless you know whose you are, you better know who the who of the whose you are is. So that's, that's what this is, too. So there's a quote on page 224 that says, Jesus is saying the reason that the world hates us is not because we're jerks, but because we love the people of this world unconditionally and reject the systems of this world wholeheartedly. The problem is most of us, particularly American Christians, love the systems of this world wholeheartedly and we reject the people of this world. So before we get into the role of the Holy Spirit, you give a bit of a backdrop to the culture and world that we're living in and how we're supposed to operate in that in this world. So can you talk a little bit about the backdrop of, before we get to the Holy Spirit, the backdrop of what the world is like? So there is no neutral there is a drift away from godliness in our culture, in our news media, in our social media, in our music, in all things that are the secular culture that we live in. It, nothing is going to drag you towards alignment with the Word of God. It reminds me of when I would take my kids to the beach when they were little, and I would be like, listen, we're putting you in the water here but trust us, every few minutes you got to look up. Remember when you were a kid and you'd look mm-hmm. up and be like, where'd mom go? Nowhere. She is exactly where she started. You have moved. And things like the gender issue, man, a, an attack on gender is an attack on the character and nature of God. Yes. Because we are supposed to be image bearers of him. Now, I know we live in a sick and broken world and everything doesn't work just right, and I get all that. But now, our society is mutilating preteen children and calling it health care. And if you say that out loud, that is referred to as hate speech. Right. You can't read the words of Jesus and, and not say, this is exactly what we're living in right now, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, our country has been a sleeping giant for a long time because the, the church culture and regular culture, married itself up for a long time, okay, which is really, really dangerous because a lot of surprise people in line on Judgment Day. Like, what do you mean I ain't in? But I went to that denominational church. Like, I, I don't even know who you are, man. You never surrendered to me. You don't know me, okay? 
I will tell you today, there's very little middle. Mm -hmm. You can't just casually be a Christian. I mean, even when I was growing up, I almost sound like an old guy. If you claim to be a Christian when I was in high school in the 80s, people people would might go, is that true? Okay. Today, you claim to be a Christian and then go, is that safe? Mm. Oh. I think it's hateful. What you think about life and about marriage and about, I mean, heck, the first book sold enough copies in the first week to make the New York Times bestseller list. Should have been number four, according to our publishers. Got scratched because of, uh, we said, marriage is between a man and a woman for a lifetime. Okay, so. Fact. Like, yeah, yeah, dude. It's the first time our publisher has ever, like, the president of the company reached out to the Times to be like, what wow. game are we playing here? You know what I mean? So anyway. Wow. All right. <clears throat> so. But I'm not bitter about that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> if. Now, the real question is, I'm, I'm telling you, there's a bunch of people riding around listening to this right now. They're like, amen. Okay, now, the real question is, if your nose hadn't been bloodied lately mm. from pushing them against the current, well, or is it because you're just going with the flow? Like, some people are indistinguishable from the enemy's team. Yes, and you use three examples in the book that most often Christians fall into the category that could be indicators that maybe they're not quite living as counterculturally as maybe they think they are. Use money, sex, and power. Why these three? Because the Bible says, do not love the things of the world. That all that the enemy has to throw at us or all that the, the world has to offer is lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That is it. And there's so many people that claim Jesus as their Lord. I, you got to think about what those words mean. Mm -hmm. Not believe on him for the forgiveness of your sin, but is he your Lord? By definition, you are relinquishing the decision-making powers to your Lord. He doesn't ask. Mm -hmm. When he says it, you do it. That's what Lord means. There's no negotiation here. And the way a lot of us want to live today is to claim Jesus as the forgiver of our sin, but I do money my way, man, period. The average Christian in America gives less than 2% to charity, not even to the local church. And that's a difference too. There's good giving and then there's gospel giving. Mm -hmm. And we are called at least baseline to bring your first 10% to him. And then if you want to, you know, save starving puppies or something else and do whatever you want to do, Okay. Or sex and sexuality. To look at the creator and be like, you don't get to tell me who I am. I get to determine I do what I want with who I want when I want, and you ain't the boss of me. You, I, don't, I don't know how in the world someone can simultaneously say, you're my Lord, and I do whatever I want. Power. I mean, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, man, the Gentiles, when we see the Gentiles there, he doesn't mean non-Jews. He means people that don't even believe in God. Mm -hmm. Lord, their authority over one another. It shall not be so among you. And yet, so many believers are running the exact same power rat race that everybody else in the world is, mm -hmm. just taste, chasing title over testimony. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So we need a helper, a.k.a. the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. We are the disciples that Jesus has ascended, and they're like, what on earth are we going to do? And so that's what this chapter is about. And how is this a miracle? Or how does this fit in the book of on miracles? One of the one of the most simplified definitions of the miraculous is when the supernatural invades the natural. Mm. What's more natural than the human body? <laughs> What's more supernatural than God's right. spirit? And literally the spirit in God invades the body of the believer. So there are a lot of aspects to the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about them. And you spend some time uh, talking about spiritual gifts because a lot of people think Holy Spirit and they automatically think spiritual gifts. And so you, I just love the light you bring to, you're not discounting spiritual gifts. There's a reason for them, but they're not the entire reason of the Holy Spirit. So can you talk a little bit about spiritual gifts and maybe how people can discern their spiritual gifts? If you're a believer in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. 
Charles alluded to some confusions between denominations when talking about baptisms and say, okay, the, the word baptism is not even a good English word. It's a transliteration of a Greek word. So if you just use the word all through Acts, if you just use the word immerse, because that's what the word means, then you see a clear distinction between, and we were immersed in the Holy Spirit when they believed, but they were filled with the Spirit multiple times. Mm. So it's not, do you have all of the Holy Spirit? The real question is, does he have all of you? Okay. One of the things that the Spirit does is every single believer is a part of the body of Christ, and we're not all the same body part, which means we need each other. And every believer has at least one spiritual gift, and no believer has all the spiritual gifts. And God puts us together as a body for the edification of the church. These are called spiritual gifts. They're not like superpowers. <clears throat> There's not an... There's not any one exhaustive list in the scriptures in one place. You've got to go to about three or four different places to kind of jam them all together to get it. Depending on your on your background, some people have a more expanded list and some people have a more narrow list. One of it, uh, you can go to our church website and take a spiritual gifts assessment. Mm -hmm. I don't love the word test because it is not an infallible document. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think I told the story in the book. This is true. I was at a, uh, I was at a college retreat. Boy, college kids get, especially like Baptist college kids that have heard of the Spirit but have yet to like <laughs> dive in at all, can go crazy town in college, right? I mean, because it's like a new, I don't know, aspect of your belief system. So we go to this spiritual gifts conference, and and we were part of this organization, and they believe way more gifts than the Bible even has, right? And so we take this really involved assessment, and mine comes back, and I'm talking to my buddy. I'm like, I'm, he's like, bro, what'd you get? I was like, I got martyrdom, which is you can be martyred, but I don't see that as a gift of the spirit, okay? And I, and I was like, it's it's cool, but you use it once and you're done. That's not <laughs> great, <laughs> you know. And I'm looking, my dude, my boy is just like stone face, like somebody just stole all his joy. I'm like, what about you? He's like, bro, I got celibacy. And I was like, <laughs> I'd rather have martyred him. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so those things, as long as you, as long as they're like tools, the way to figure out what your role in the body is, what how you've been gifted, is get to work in the body of Christ, period. Mm. You just set your sails, the wind will blow you where God wants you to. Have some other godly people in your life that you're doing ministry with and Here's how you'll begin to know when people look at you and say, you know what I see in you? Mm. Or have you ever considered or you've been faithful with this little? Can I give you more? Mm. So That's I would have never taken a test in, in, as an 18-year-old or whatever and been like, oh, I have the gift of teaching and preaching. But Coach Lee made me. Mm. And then when I got done, he said, boy, when you teach the Bible, I see two things happen. I see you come alive. I see them come alive. Mm. So that's that's the key, is to just get in the body. You got to one another with one another, you know? I mean, think about it. Like, because the other thing that happens in the church, I mean, the, I, this happens with church planners all the time. They're like, I have the gift of preaching. And I'm like, well, nobody's going to ever have the gift of listening to your sermons because they're not good, <laughs> man. So even, even if you think God made you to be an author, there's only one way to know. You got to write some books and see if anybody wants to read them. So that's it. You guys just got to get in the game, start playing. That's good. Anything you add? One of the things that the Lord has sort of corrected in me, or there can be a danger in this whole conversation on the Holy Spirit. You, you begin chasing the gift rather than the giver. Right. Mm, preach. And and that's what you know. I think that's what it became in, in my early childhood, and 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 it, and it can become that in any time, but. One of the things I think the Lord has been faithful to show me while I've certainly seen him heal and deliver and save and I've seen the miraculous. One of the things he's brought me back to time and time again is don't don't be enamored by the power you see me exercising. Mm -hmm. My question for you, Charles, is if my spirit is in you, are you doing what I commanded? Are you loving your wife like Ephesians 5 says? Is that is there fruit of the Spirit in your life? Are you laying down your life for her? Are you quick to forgive? Are you walking in repentance? You can't, like, these are foundational things that I think 
it is possible in this whole conversation with the Spirit to step out to sort of take your eyes off the cross, which Paul talks about in Galatians 3. It was sort of like take them off the cross and begin looking at the, you know, what might be a circus or a sideshow or whatever and be enamored by that shiny new thing. And, and I'm not, look, we ought to be pursuing the gifts. The scripture says, pursue the gifts earnestly. We should be, absolutely. We should be operating them, functioning, receiving whatever the Lord has for us. We also need to recognize the thing in us that would like to pervert or taint or abuse that. So I think if, when we walk in humility, rightly submitted to leadership, which is huge, because you'll see in a body people like me coming up and serving in a church and and begin a, not, no longer being submitted to the authority of that place and begin wanting to assume their authority, mm. which is a power play, which is from the spirit of darkness. So... I don't know, I've gone on a little bit of rabbit trail, but the, 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 the tension in this thing, one of the things I think we were careful to write about in the book is, yes, absolutely, God is doing what he did. Yes, it is absolutely his desire for us to receive that from him and greater things. I, these things I've done, you will do and greater things you will do because I'm going to be with the Father and I'm sending you my spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely his desire that we do them. Matthew 10 is still true. Preach the word, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Those are our marching orders. Yes, he wants us to do that. The caveat is when we begin pursuing that at the expense of really being laid out on our faces before him and mm -hmm. submitted. And if he tells us not to do something, can we hear that as clearly as we think we're hearing him to tell us to do something? It's actually a perfect parallel. What we've been talking about, every chapter, every sermon is, it's not just about the miracle, it's about the miracle maker. And it's not just about the gifts, it's about the gift giver. And so I think that distinction is so important. And I think you guys make that really clear. Um, so you talk about the nine, that there are nine roles as you read it in John 14, 15, John 14, 15, and 16, nine roles of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, this really helped me. It gave me language to pray that I hadn't had before of like, Lord, you say that the Holy Spirit is going to help me to share my faith. So will you mm -hmm. do that right now? And so I would love to just go through each of the nine roles and just briefly talk about what they mean. Obviously, people are going to hear it in the sermon. Mm -hmm. They can read it in the book. Um, but it just gave me some really great language as I have been praying um, and my perspective of the Holy Spirit. So the first one is the Holy Spirit empowers you to share your faith. Yeah, there's a lot of people who say the, the primary evidence of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, not according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. The primary evidence is evangelism. Yeah. I mean, look what happens on Acts 2, the day at Pentecost, is that tongues of fire hit Peter. He preaches a gospel sermon, and 3,000 people get saved and baptized. Yeah. Acts 1.8 says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and not do a miracle. That's not the primary thing, but you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, mm -hmm. Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In Matthew 28, when Jesus gives the, the great commission, therefore go, make disciples, and and then at the end, he gives this great promise, and I will be with you always to the very ends of the age. How is he with us? It's because he deposits the Holy Spirit in every believer. Mm -hmm. So the primary evidence of the Spirit of God is sharing your faith because the Spirit is all about Jesus. So the Spirit always wants to point people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second one, Charles, you can you can do this one. Is God the role of the Holy Spirit is God's presence is with you? Hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would just let's go back to the what is it? Last episode, woman with the issue of blood. Mm -hmm. What prompted her elbow her way through the crowd? Mm. Um, you know, you said you were praying, Lord, give me the give me the gumption, give me the faith to share my faith. You know, what, what inspires that prayer in the first place is very presence with us. So I don't, the amazing thing to me as I sort of look at this whole thing is that until Acts 2, 
God inhabited a space inside a tent, Mm -hmm. then a cloud and fire, then a temple, and a very small space inside the temple. And then he chooses, after the execution of his son, to say, you know what? Watch out, here I come. And he fills each of us so that we're walking, living, breathing temples. That's like, what kind of God does that? That he would share his very presence and spirit with us to the extent that he chooses to live inside of us. Yeah, for sure. Third is the Holy Spirit teaches us and brings to remembrance the things that we have been taught. That's a good one. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I say it all the time. I get the opportunity to preach and they're moderately delivered and exceptionally received. And the reason when they are, ex- when my sermons are exceptionally received is because the spirit of God in you is teaching you. I've never taught you anything. There's no way I can. I can expose you to the word of God. I cannot expose the word of God to you. Or to say it another way, how many times have you ever been reading something you've read a hundred times and then the spirit of God goes and opens your eyes to understand a thing that you just didn't know before. Who does that? Spirit of God does it in you. Yeah. It's been cool for me to think through that as a writer because I look at these, you know, I look from John 1 through the end of Revelation and I look at these writers, these men who walked with the Lord, loved the Lord, died for the Lord. How did they remember all of this? And yet they did. And every word is absolutely mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the Lord, the Spirit of God did bring to their remembrance, John, even in his old age, Brought to his remembrance. Luke, how much did he remember? You know, he's sitting there with both Peter and Paul. But I love the thought, I love the fact that the Spirit of God moves in writers to remember. And I cannot tell you the number of times. He was talking about me the other day in my recalling of Scripture. I don't feel like I have a great recollection of Scripture. I feel like his is much better. But I I can mention a thousand times where I've been sitting there working on something, and I remember a word. And I'll go to my Bible app and I'll search the word and the scripture will come up and I'll go, oh yeah, that fits perfect. So I'll fit that in there. So then mm. guys like him think I have some great recall. Well, I I remembered a word, and but that was just the spirit kind of mm. saying, That's hey, good. remember that? It's good. The next one is the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning sin. Ooh. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, blessed are the poor in spirit. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit for you to realize that you are spiritually bankrupt. Mm. He also convicts the believer of sin, and that is God's grace upon you, that he would love you enough to tap you on the shoulder and be like, Mm. that's going to hurt if you go down that road. Mm. The next one is the role of the Holy Spirit is judgment. Yeah, man, there's coming a day (laughs) where every single one of us is standing before the Lord and... If you don't know Jesus, people are like, well, oh, isn't that, I mean, you're going to scare people. You should be freaking terrified. Mm-hmm. You should sleep with a bike helmet and a cup on and one eye open. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. People jack around with the Lion of Judah, and it ain't going to be funny one day, you know? Right. I mean, I know hell, hellfire and brimstone ain't real popular to preach, but neither is going to heaven. That's it's right. a narrow gate, and it's a, there's a real judgment coming in if you don't know Jesus, I would beg you to repent of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And it's his kindness that leads you to repentance. Mm-hmm. Fear will never lead you to repentance. It's his kindness. But how kind of him to convict you of your sin that you would know that you're going to stand guilty before a holy and just judge one day. Mm-hmm. And what are you going to do about that unless you would take the deal that Jesus makes on your behalf and says, I'll take his place. Mm-hmm. There's a, um, if you look at the first public words of John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul, Peter, Stephen, look at the first five of the seven letters in Revelation. The first word out of their mouth is repent. It's a commandment. The reason for that is because there is a judgment coming. Mm-hmm. What the words coming out of my mouth right now are diagnosed in our culture as hate speech. Mm -hmm. Who am I going to repent to? 
Well, you're going to meet him one day. You have two options. You can bow now or you can bow then. But bow or bow is the option. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, at the very end, I just saw this the other day, at the very end of the book of Zechariah, somewhere around chapter 13, it says, God will pour out on his people a spirit of grace and supplication. That, that spirit of grace, thank God for that. And we're writing about that now. But that spirit of supplication is the thing in me that he gives me that's willing to, that is able to look at my own stuff and bring to him and repent for my sin. And I mm. pray that. I've been praying, Lord, give me that. Give me your grace and a spirit of supplication that I would be convicted of my own sin and not run in shame, but just bring it to you. There's nothing you don't know anyway. Mm. And the, the, the judgment that's coming is not because he wants to get rid of us. The judgment that's coming is because he has spent since before eternity, like eternity past to now, he has spent that amount of time returning us to the Father. Mm. His desire is for us to be with his Father. His desire is not for us to absolutely burn in hell. And if you need evidence A before the jury, it is the cross of Jesus. Mm. What would convict the king of all kings, what would convince the king of all kings to come and do that for a bunch of sinners like us? Well, he loves us. Mm. That's good. So there is no salvation without repentance. Here's an idea for the book they're working on now. So watch this back and drop this down. <laughs> we got to go find the details, but there's, a, there's an event, there's a story of a guy, <clears throat> I think he was on death row in Texas. And the judge got the, I mean, the governor got all of the information and issued a pardon to the guy. And the guy refused it because he felt like he deserved to die, even though a pardon was given. Made it all the way to the Supreme Court because what do you do if the governor who has the authority to forgive, but the person won't receive it? And there's like a, a U.S. Supreme Court verdict that says until the guilty one receives the pardon or in, unless they receive the pardon then wow it's meaningless wow, yeah. that's the gospel that, that is, is yeah wow so somebody jot that down <laughs> we'll revisit i that. just remember a friend of mine <laughs> told me that story it's a and it's an actual yeah, that's it's, good. yeah we'll look at all the stuff love it but that's it that's why it, like it's his kindness that leads us to repentance it's it's not the guy screaming at you on the bullhorn, repent. That's not what the, it is. It's like, oh, why don't you turn around? Yeah. You know what it is? It's really, it's the, it's the dad in Luke 15 and the story of the prodigal son going out to the older son. And he's down on his knees entreating him, which come in the party. That's yeah. what God's kindness inviting us to repent is. This, you've always been my son. All I've had has always been yours. This party's for you too, why don't you come in the party? Mm. That's the invitation. That's good. All right, the next role of the Holy Spirit is that he guides you in all truth. Yeah, it's, it's back to the Word of God, man. This, and he guides you to Jesus. Jesus didn't say he tells the truth. He says, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I would encourage all, all the, like, hardcore Baptist-raised people you got to lean into the Spirit of God. He wants to guide you in truth. Like when there's that thing going on at work and you don't know what the right response is as a believer, the Spirit of God wants to guide you in a direction. That it, it, it's probably not easy, mm -hmm. but it's true. Mm. Which that leads well into the next one. The Holy Spirit leads us to worship Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it's back to, <clears throat> I think you said it last episode or two ago or something, I get confused. <laughs> <clears throat> the end of Genesis, Abraham sends his servant to go get a, a wife for his son. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful picture of the Trinity and the church. The father, on behalf of the son, sends a helper to go get the bride. Mm -hmm. And Charles pointed out that the servant is mentioned over 40 times, but never by name. One of the things when people will say, how come we don't talk about the, the Holy Spirit more in church? I'm like, I check with him. He don't want to, he don't <laughs> want us to talk about him a lot. As much as the text does, we will for sure. But 
if the Trinity got cast in a play, Jesus would be on stage, God would be God the Father would be directing it, and the Holy Spirit's in the back working the spotlight, yeah. just always aiming it at Jesus. That's so good. Two more. The Holy Spirit helps us pray. Several times I have not known how. Scripture does say with groanings we don't and words we don't understand, but a bunch of times I've not known how to pray, and I, and I will ask. I will stop. I've either been praying with people or praying by myself, and I will stop, and I will say, Jesus, I don't know how to pray. Spirit, will you please show me how to pray in this moment? I've yeah. said words after that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm hopeful that some of those were filled by his Spirit. This is my favorite part of the Holy Spirit during prayer and anointing because, you know, sometimes people come up, and they say things they need to be prayed for, and I think... I have no idea what to pray for you for, Mm -hmm. but I'm just going to start and I'm going to hope that the Holy Spirit gives me words. And he does every time. And you can feel their body language physically respond to whatever you're saying, which is you're always like, oh, good. I guess I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. I keep saying these words. (laughs) My friend J.D. Greer says, uh, the best way to guarantee your prayers are heard is pray the prayers that started in heaven. Mm. So in other words, he's like, pray the word, man. If you... If you listen to Charles pray, what you'll hear is you just yeah, not necessarily like just p- quoting Bible verses, but it's just saturated yeah. in Scripture. That's so true. Same with you. I think you both. I think you both have equal amounts of Scripture memorized, and you probably downplay it. We were going to dinner you. the other night. That's what was going on. We were going to dinner, and then we we're going to go. <clears throat> we're going to book the next day, and. And that's why I came up. I mean, I was uh, I was like, dude, I feel like you just know so much scripture. And it was great. It was a little mutual admiration. Yeah. It's like, dude, you know way more than me. It's like, I know, I, know a, I know chunks, but I need to add to it, man. I, I need to oh my gosh. memorize more okay. scripture. I'm, I'm I cannot tell you the number of times with the two of you. we've been talking about something and I'll go, yeah, yeah, where is that? He'll go, that's in uh, John 10, and I'm over here in Luke. You both do it to each other Uh, with your Bibles open right before we started recording. You said, what chapter are we in? And I just take out my anything as possible. I'm like, oh, well, we're in chapter 7. You know, the Bible. And then both (laughs) of you are opening it up. So you're just going to outdo one another. All right, last one is the Holy Spirit brings us peace. All right, well, let me just let me say this. One of the most powerful books I've ever read in my life, and I've said this a bunch, before you read any of my stuff, you should go read the biography called The Heavenly Man. It's about Brother Chun or Yun, or I'm sorry, I'm so totally messing up his name, but it's, I finished that book. It's, it's how, it's, it's this man in China who helped start and grow at great bodily expense, imprisonment, torture, everything in China, the house movement in, in China. And he, all he had was a Bible. So he memorized it. And I mean, he memorized it. And two things happened. Uh, well, a lot of things happened, but the men who, or the people, and it was a men's prison. So the men who survived prison knew the word. And in those moments, it's what came out of them. Mm-hmm. I pray to God that that is the case with me, with us. Yeah. And two is the Holy Spirit would help him remember it. And even this to this day, I'm told that when he speaks, many times he'll just walk up there and begin singing scripture. And I don't know how long it goes, but it goes on for a while. And then he'll sit down and the Spirit of God just falls in that place. Right. Now, you can argue with whether or not that's the best hermeneutical text. And I don't care. All I know is that the scripture says it's life to those who find it and health to one's, mm-hmm. one's whole flesh. And you can't live on bread alone, but only on the words that come out. So he's got those in there. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit breathes them out of him. I would love to be more in that place. It reminds me when um, Pastor David Platt came and preached here at Saturated. And he said no words of his own when he got up there. And he recited Psalm 148, one, 148 149, 149, 150. 150. That's right. Just straight, and the atmosphere changed. That's it just correct. did. You That's know, correct. by the end, people are standing and clapping. Like you could just feel it. And he hadn't uttered one of his own words. It was incredible. Okay, so last one. He brings us peace. So think about. So that word of shalom means to be made whole, to be right with God. It's not an absence of war. It's it's it is well. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you go back to the very beginning, 
And God the Father decides that through the through God the Son, He would speak all things into creation as the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. So there they are. <laughs> and then He fashions together the very first man. And what does He breathe into His nostrils that He comes alive? The Ruach, which is spirit. is It's wind or breath or spirit. The... Hebrew language is artistically vague there on purpose. Mm. So it's like that thing is like you, the very essence of your life is what the Spirit of God is in you. Okay. So the very first man opens his eyes. He's face to face with his heavenly creator in an unhindered relationship. There's, there's no, what's he worried about? What's he confused about? What's he anxious? Nothing. There's nothing. And the role of the Spirit of God through the blood of Jesus is to reconcile you back to the fathers, that that would be your existential reality. Mm. Gives me goosebumps. That I am so beloved. So as we round out this book and this podcast series... What are some closing words that you would like to encourage people with just as we finish out this book, Anything is Possible? I sure do hope that in people's time of need and desperation and their, it could have been circumstances that drive you to your knees, that drive you to God to ask that your eyes would look through the empty tomb and to the cross and that you would know he loves you. He's mm-hmm. for you. He hears you. He's good. And your current circumstances do not define his goodness. The cross and the empty tomb define his goodness. Mm-hmm. He has demonstrated his love for you fully and finally. And he's a good dad. Mm-hmm. He's a good dad. And he wants to give good gifts to his kids. And if you chase the shiny things, whether it's like good gifts like houses and cars, or you chase the shiny things, which it can even be demonstrations of the power of the Spirit of God, but you don't chase after Him, no good dad would give his kid a rock if he asked for bread mm. or give his kid a scorpion if he asked for a fish. And it could actually be a really negative gift for God to give you what you're asking for if what if you, what you don't really understand is that you need him. I mean, that new song that our team wrote, you know, it says, God, all I really need is you. Mm. All I really need is you. And so I hope this this book helps people understand that. Yeah. How about you, Charles? Lately I've been praying, um, you know, when Mary she's heard that they've taken the body of Jesus and um, she runs back. And we talked about in one of the episodes why she's probably fearful. They, Jesus drove seven demons out of her. She's worried if he didn't, can't defeat death. Are they coming back? And so she's, she also loves him in a really right and healthy way. And she's, she's angry and probably furious that somebody's stolen the body of her Lord. And it's arguable that nobody believed in her more as Lord than she did. Mm. She really pestuoed in Jesus. And she runs to the tomb. So in answer to your question, she runs to the tomb. Body's gone. She runs in, pokes her head in. Body's gone. And she bumps into the gardener. And she's 18 inches from the gardener. And they have this strange conversation. What are you looking for? Why? Why? And she's like, sir, if you've taken his body, just show me and I won't, you know, really just be between us and... Jesus does a beautiful thing here. He just looks at her and he says, Mary, and my prayer for this book is that the Lord would just start calling people's names and he would just call them and that they, like Mary, would respond, my Lord and my God, Mm. and they would come out of their skin to yield and surrender to the righteous reign of the Son of God who knew no sin to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God so that we can return to the Father. Mm. That's good. So 
this book? Is there is there a, another one that we're working on in the future? What's next for the two of you and your writing partnership? It's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're working on book three right now. Yeah, great. Run over by the grace train. Yes. We're going to talk about how when you experience the grace of Jesus Christ, there's no way after that encounter you can walk away the same. Mm. Well, I can't wait. And maybe we'll be back to talk about it every week, but thank you so much for just being a part of the discipleship of our church and writing books that are going to impact people and talking to microphones on a podcast that's going to impact people and it all just matters. And and I'm personally just so grateful for the two of you and your faithfulness and obedience to what God's called you to. So can I pray for us? Please. Heavenly Father, God, I just, I thank you for just how you've shown up over the past nine weeks in the life of our church, at the altars, in disciple groups, in the quiet moments of people reading their Anything Is Possible copy who maybe have never even stepped into the doors of one of our campuses, but you're changing their life through these words and through these two men that I sit with. And I'm just so grateful for them, for their faithfulness to your word, for their um, faithfulness to the anointings and callings on their lives. And uh, just that we get to experience so much wisdom and um so much knowledge and love and counseling because they're so faithful to you. And Lord, I pray that this book has changed people. I pray that it will continue to change people. I pray that um, it wouldn't just be about the miracles, but they would see that woven throughout this entire book is the resounding narrative that a really great savior came to earth and died for us and was resurrected, and that when we trust in that miracle maker, then we know that regardless of what our circumstances are, what our world is, that he is good and he is in control. And I just pray that people be reminded of that today. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful for all the work you're doing through our church. And we just pray that you would continue to show favor upon us. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the podcast. (laughs) The end. You nailed it. (laughs)